Welcome to Phoenix Masonry Live. A show that brings you talented Freemasons, Masonic authors, artists, craftsmen, and Masons of accomplishment. I am Frederick L. Milliken, Executive Director of Phoenix Masonry. And I am David Bindle. And we are here to celebrate our Freemasonry. That's what we do at Phoenix Masonry. We celebrate our Freemasonry. And I'm here today with David Bindle celebrating Brother Hondo Nakar. And we're at the Scottish Rite Temple in downtown Dada, Dallas. Welcome to the show, Brother Hondo. Thank you very much. I think that one of the things that really struck me, Hondo, was when I went to your concert and watched you play Rachmaninoff Concerto Number no. 3. That was really inspiring to me. And so why don't we lead off the show with a little clip from that memorable moment of your playing.
Okay, we're back now. And uh, I just wanted to say that um, I watched you play that. I went to your concert. And that's one of the most difficult pieces to play for a pianist. Has been a judge so by the experts that know such. Am I correct? You are absolutely correct. <laughs> you played that piece with the orchestra and it went for a, approximately an hour and you did not look at one piece of music at any time. I, I, you know, Hondo, that's, that's remarkable. How, do you, how did you do it? Well, thank you very much. I just do it, I think. Lots uh, of practice. <laughs> yeah, lots of practice. As the saying goes, practice, practice, practice. That's what it is. But of course, with pieces like Rachmaninoff or Third Piano Concerto, it's, it's a little bit different because it's so big, it's so long, uh, so definitely more practice goes into a piece like that. Okay, well, let's get a little bit into your history. You were born in Tallinn, Estonia, and uh, tell us about your hometown, how big it is and what it's like. Well, I was born in Tallinn. Uh, Tallinn is the capital of Estonia. It's not very big, about a half million people living there, and uh, it's been more or less that uh, for a long time already. Uh, so it's the biggest uh, city in Estonia. I think what's great about it, and if I would have to describe it, uh, is uh, basically uh, the fact that uh, in a way it's very small, at the same time it's very big. And I think uh, when I say it's very big, then I'm talking about what's happening there. A lot is going on there. People do many things, uh, people are active and uh, they just uh, like to uh, be uh, Estonians and uh, make sure that they, they make a difference. You have, you have a beautiful picture of uh, Estonia to, that, that, that we can show. I do. I have several actually and these are uh, really my favorite pictures, I think, uh, of um, Tallinn, uh, as we were just talking about it. Uh, so, what I have here, if you look at the first one, um, uh, this is, yes, a wonderful view of our uh, old town in Tallinn. And um, why I like these pictures uh, is, of course, because of all the lighting and everything, uh, the sunset, that I think it's just uh, beautiful. You can see here uh, th that it's not very big. This is basically our old town. And, um, well, I'm not going to really talk about each building separately, but you can see uh, many important places here. One thing I'd like to bring out, which is that uh, tower, stone tower here, kind of uh, not uh, too uh, clearly uh, seen on the picture. It's kind of far away. It's close to the sea, but it's on the left side there, close to the center. It's a stone tower. It's called a tall Herman Tower. And why I want to say a few words about it is because this is a very important uh, tower for us and has been throughout the history. If you look at this picture now, we can see that tower uh, here um, very clearly. It's located uh, next to the uh, government building. And as you see on top of that tower, uh, there is our flag, blue, black and white. Why it's so important is that uh, this is really a, a symbol of our freedom and uh, symbol of uh, the government in power. And uh, what's happening here is basically, it's not just a tower. So every day, every single day, especially talking about now the last uh, period of time we've been independent since 91, uh, every morning uh, at the time of sunrise, the flag is raised and accompanied uh, by the national anthem. And every evening, at the time of sunset, it's lowered and is accompanied by another very important uh, song uh, for Estonian people, national song called My Fatherland is My Love. So and that, that ritual, so-called, is happening every day. And I think this is wonderful and, and it's great they're doing it. So that really signifies our uh, uh, country and our freedom. And of course, uh, when we were part of uh, the Soviet Union, there was another kind of flag on the top of that tower. And when that, of course, got changed, that was 50 years before 1991, then, of course, this was a very, very sad moment for us. And it took 50 years for us then to get back to this point where we have this flag there. Is this a place where the community gathers every day for those uh, flag raising and lowering ceremonies? Sure. Uh, I'm sure there are people who go to see that, and I think it's just beautiful. So it's happening every day. And one more picture here about Tallinn. That's the 
uh, so-called uh, downtown then. And you can see, basically, they're right next to each other, these uh, areas, right? Downtown and Old Town, it's all very small. And it's also, I think, very beautiful. It has developed over the last 10, 15 years this way. You know, a few bigger buildings and uh, business buildings, uh, basically. So again, uh, showing that everything's kind of small, but uh, Estonians are moving forward with the rest of the world and uh, developing uh, as everybody else. Well, you've been in the United States here about 15 years now. Uh, Hondo, uh, do you visit uh, Estonia often, and do you have family still there? Yes, I do visit, and I do have family there. Uh, so what I try to do <coughs> every year, twice or so, I try to go back. Usually, when it's um, uh, holidays or uh, summertime, you know, to see my folks, friends there, and sometimes more than that, uh, when I have to perform and give concerts there. So. Well, tell us a little about the culture, lifestyle, and customs of Estonia. I know that's a that's a big question to answer. It's a big question, and uh, we don't have much time for that. But I think if I'd like to bring out something, then uh, one very important thing is um, uh, singing tradition that we have going uh, in Estonia, and we've had that throughout our history. And uh, talking about customs and culture and all these things, so I think it's all connected to that, and this is really our main thing. And eventually, uh, that led us uh, to freedom in 1991. Uh, if you've heard about that, uh, uh, this uh, moment of change in uh, Estonian history was called the Singing Revolution. So it's just not a random title, it comes from a very long tradition. So basically, I think Estonian people are uh, big singers, and uh, singers at heart, really. And uh, we often, I think, communicate our feelings uh, through singing. Uh, and uh, the way this tradition is uh, expressed uh, is uh, by uh, having uh, a huge song festival in every five years mm. in Tallinn and uh, under huge I really mean huge uh, so we are talking about 30,000 singers singing wow. at the same time and wow. not just at that moment but having rehearsed for it for months wow. meaning high quality singing 30,000 people so you can imagine the sound right and then you would have 100,000 people at least uh, there um, in the audience uh, listening to it and being part of it and actually singing along. So that's what it's all about. So it's all about this huge singing event. And uh, that's uh, been something that's been going on for a long time. Uh, first one, I think, took place 1869. Okay. So, and uh, again, uh, why I'm uh, bringing this up as something very important, talking about traditions and things, is because I think definitely that uh, this tradition uh, was uh, one of the main things that kept Estonians going uh, while we were occupied. Do you know how that tradition began? Well, it began uh, by uh, f finding a way, I think, uh, for people to get together and sing together Estonian music and expressing again their feelings about their uh, culture and uh, nationality. So that's how it started. Uh, so we're, we're talking about the uh, culture and lifestyle and customs of Estonia, and you, you have another picture. Yes, I have another picture, and again, I think it's it's wonderful uh, picture of Estonia. It's so simple, at the same time, uh, objective. So, of course, I, I couldn't find a picture that would cover the entire country, right? But I think everything is said uh, on this picture, meaning um, Estonia is flat, it's beautiful, uh, lots of nature. If you go, of course, uh, outside of Tallinn, uh, and, uh, you know, endless beautiful fields, uh, lots of uh, forests uh, and all these things. Uh, and uh, it's, I think, beautifully uh, put in this picture. Great. Uh, Hando, you come from a musical family. Tell us about the talents of your family. Yes, I do, and uh, that's been a blessing uh, because uh, I think that there's been great support uh, throughout my life in my musical activities uh, uh, because it all got started, uh, I think, uh, from my family's tradition. My father um, is a piano professor at the Estonian Academy of Music. My mother uh, was a piano teacher at the Tallinn uh, Music High School. And I have two sisters. One of them plays the violin, and the other one is a pianist. So we are all musicians. And does one play for the Symphony Orchestra of Estonia? Yes, she does. First violin, is she? First violin. I think yep. I remember you She's telling me that. <laughs> yeah. Did your parents have hopes that you would take up piano, or was that kind of something that came from within yourself? I think it was uh, half and half. Uh, of course they had hopes, but at the same time I think they were realistic and they knew that uh, they shouldn't have too high hopes, because very often, you know, 
children want to do different things, and uh, that's natural. Uh, so, but in my case, I think thanks to them, of course, I had the, the fantastic platform to take it on and try what it is, and then decide at some point. And I think if I had decided different, uh, they wouldn't have been disappointed. Okay. You know, uh, what I think is another remarkable part of your story, Hondo, is that you, you started at 15, you made your debut with the Estonian National Opera Orchestra, and at 16, you debuted with the Estonian National Symphony Orchestra. Now, wh what's the biggest uh, concert hall in Estonia? The biggest concert hall in Estonia is Estonia Concert Hall. And you have a beautiful picture of that, I think. Yes, I do. <laughs> and uh, maybe more than one yeah I have actually uh, three <laughs> total uh, so we could look at that one first uh, yeah, so that's this beautiful. is yeah beautiful I think uh, from outside again nothing too uh, extravagant right uh, but it's still huge uh, if you go inside you see the size of it really I think it's really grand so 1,000 seats uh, that's pretty huge wow. and beautiful balconies and everything this definitely is yeah for musicians in Estonia, the number one place to perform. And I've been also very fortunate, of course, to perform there several times throughout my life uh, with orchestras uh, and uh, as a soloist. And here's another picture of me actually playing there one year and a half ago at the uh, Tallinn uh, Piano Festival, which is a great uh, festival. It takes place uh, once in every two years. And I was invited there as a guest artist. Uh, so, and that's me there. In recital, you see uh, that huge screen behind me. By the way, that's also that's not random. It was there for one piece because I played a composition uh, by an Estonian composer, Erkis Ventur, and I had put together before that concert already a video uh, that goes uh, with the sonata. And again, this is like my creation uh, and uh, about uh, the way I see that music and what it represents. So actually, it's uh, nothing else than beautiful pictures of Estonian nature, uh, so, and I wanted to play the video with the piece, and it was interesting to see how it got all uh, synchronized. It worked out actually uh, very well. Well, you came to the United States about 15 years ago, and you now hold five degrees from four universities in the USA. Yale University School of Music, New England Conservatory of Music, Texas Christian University School of Music, and SMU Meadows School of the Arts. And you have, I believe, completed your DMA, Doctor of Musical Arts. Have you just completed that? I have not completed it yet, uh, but I'm uh, very close, very close, <laughs> yes. Hopefully next spring, hopefully next spring. So that's very exciting. Yeah, long list in a way, right? So I can't believe it myself. I think it's, uh, it's, it's like a miracle that it's all been possible. And yes, I've been to all uh, these places and it's, it's been a fantastic journey, really. What, what was it like when you first came to the United States? Uh, how did you uh, feel like you integrated with the culture when you first came? Well, in the beginning, of course, everything was new. Uh, at the same time, uh, I felt uh, very much like at home, uh, right at the beginning. And uh, before actually coming here uh, to study, I was very uh, lucky to have a few opportunities to visit America, not for studies or anything else, but just uh, to play here concerts. Okay. And this was great for me because uh, this gave me this opportunity to really see America as much as was possible, you know, over a two-week period or something. Traveled around uh, both East Coast, West Coast, short visits here and there, but I had a sense to breathe uh, the air. And uh, honestly, I must say, that was exactly that time. So that's one of the things we, we say often in life, you know, oh, some things just go a certain way and later on you realize, oh, okay, it was meant to be. So I think for me definitely this was also one of these moments uh, because at that time when I made these trips, uh, uh, tours uh, to the States to play concerts, uh, uh, then uh, I was actually just thinking that uh, I'd like to look around outside of Estonia. What are the possibilities, you know, in terms of uh, maybe studying somewhere and, and doing things like that. And I had many options on my list, right, the whole Europe in a way, different universities. But these two trips really made me feel that, okay, I'm interested in America and there's something here I really feel I connect with, although it was, uh, you know, just a few very short visits. Have you figured out what that special something was? It's uh, difficult to... Uh, put this in words, uh, um, 
I would say I just uh, you know there is this also this saying like you you sense things in air, mm -hmm. and that's what happened to me. It was just this kind of feeling like, okay, wow, uh, there's something. I mean, I loved of course everything, a beautiful nature. I love the size, of course. That was also one thing I noticed. I was like, okay, wow, cool, everything is so big. I love it. Of course, it's because I'm coming from Estonia. It was so small, but there was something there uh, that just uh, made me feel like okay. I can't explain what it is, but uh, I feel I'm connected to something here. And that for me was a very important feeling because very often uh, with other things in life I felt this, which is, you know, they call, uh, they call this uh, like this so-called uh, gut feeling, right, which you have inside and they always say, okay, if you feel that, go with it, right, so, and that's what I did, so. Right. Um, tell us how you became a Freemason, was it here or in Estonia? It was here. Ah. It was in Massachusetts. To be uh, more precise, it was actually in uh, Boston area. Mm. So that's where it all started for me. And it's very interesting because I was there only for two years, actually shortest stop I've ever made in any place in America. Uh, you know, I was uh, at Yale for three years, two years in Boston, and then other places. Uh, that was when I you were with the, uh, studying at the New England Conservatory New England of Conservatory. Music? Yes, well, yes. Yeah. So I'm sitting here with two Massachusetts Freemasons. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly true. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, you have Freemasonry in Estonia. Uh, uh, you have uh, Grand Lodge there. Yeah, and you have a nice picture of that. Place. Yes, I have one picture here. Yeah. The thing is, for me, of course, uh, because I became a Mason here, and this was now, oh my goodness, time is flying, 11 years ago, yeah? Uh, so that's why, of course, uh, everything I've done in masonry mainly, of course, has been here. So I've done very little in Estonia. I know many masons in Estonia, but the thing is that, as we know, you know, schedules are different. So whenever uh, I go there, usually it's either holidays or summer, and in Estonia, lodges don't meet at these times. Uh, so it's been very difficult to really participate in in their. Uh, regular uh, events. At the same time, of course, I'm hoping to do that one day uh, if I'm uh, uh, there at the time when things are happening. So, but still, I've uh, visited with many uh, brethren there. I have many friends that are Masons, and I was even uh, taken a yard to the Grand Lodge of Estonia not long ago for a little tour. Again, there's nothing going on really the summer time, and I was able to see the place, and I was absolutely blown away because uh, I think it looked great. Uh, it's all new because they built everything, uh, I think, recently, again, because the entire country, in a way, had to be uh, rebuilt uh, starting 1991. Right. So, and here's a great picture of uh, one of the large rooms uh, in the Grand Lodge of Estonia, and you can see uh, already on that picture, you know, so many cars, everything is really, like, new and shining and, and really cool, I think, so. It's a beautiful room, and it looks like it's set up for a, a Holy Royal Arch, the English tradition. Yes, yes. <laughs> Well, I, I'm curious of what, what, what you might have heard about Freemasonry before you uh, submitted your application. How were you approached? Uh, friend? Well, long story, but uh, I'll try to make it short. So, yes, I had a friend, uh, Estonian friend, actually, in Boston, yeah. and got along with him uh, really well and had uh, known him already for a long time. And uh, then, uh, I, well, I had several friends there, and then once uh, happened to go uh, to a concert in... Uh, Lexington, uh, National uh, Heritage National Museum. National Heritage Museum. It was just Museum. a concert. I didn't play even uh, that concert. I was just here to listen to the concert with a friend of mine, another friend of mine, not the Mason friend, right? So I was there with him, uh, but they were friends. So, and I was looking around and I was like, okay, that's interesting. Of course, I've read different things about Masonry in the past and I recognize now uh, things here, you know, symbols, uh, uh, historic things. So definitely it's not just few things here and there. It's, it's about that in a way. And then I was like, okay, that's interesting. And uh, since I'm with that guy, so I'm going to just ask about it because I never had that chance before, really. And then I asked, you know, what is this all about? And, and I see all these uh, symbols and uh, Masonic, uh, you know, things. Uh, so, and then he, he was able to tell me a few things that, yeah, well, it goes back uh, in history in a long time and it's this brotherhood and so forth. Uh, but then he made the long story uh, in a way short and just said, okay, if you're interested uh, more in it, uh, he said he doesn't know much about it, talk to that friend, uh, which uh, whom we both knew, right, our mutual friend, and he will tell you more about it. And I was like, okay, cool, good to know. And then at some point I did that. And I talked to him, I, I told him I went there, and I was just kind of curious to know what it's all about and why there's so many things in the museum and what's, what's going on. 
And then at some point he said, well, it's great you're asking about these things. I can give you all the answers you want because I'm a mason and I've already been that for a long time. Uh -huh. And then I realized, okay, this is great because in the beginning, really, I didn't know anybody. Maybe I had met people who were masons, but I never really knew anybody who was a mason. And that to me also, again, talking about signs, right, and things you sense in there, like I said, uh, me coming to the States in the first place. Then I felt like, okay, I could think of it as something that is just, you know, whatever random thing, or uh, it could be something that, oh, okay, wow, this is a chance for me to learn more about it. Because in a way I had heard about it in the past, but I never got to that point feeling like, okay, I would like to just uh, go myself to a lodge and ask about it and, and figure uh, out more what it is to be a mason or become one, right? And I thought, okay, this is wonderful. I have that interest. I definitely want to go further with it, explore it. So and now I have this so-called fantastic friend, and he's also a mason. So I'm going to ask him everything I want to ask. And that's uh, what we did. And then it led to that, uh, of course, which was uh, him saying that if you're interested, you know, come check us out. We have our next uh, large meeting coming up soon. You don't have to decide anything. Just come uh, with me and I'll show you around. And, and that's how it started. Very interesting. In, in the United States, there's, a, there's a, a widespread conception in the public of masonry being something akin to a conspiracy. There, there are many conspiracy theories. In right. In the uh, in the uh, in the mind of the country. Same in um, Is it the same in Estonia? And did you have any of those preconceptions when you first heard about masonry in Estonia? I'm gonna be honest. Absolutely, absolutely. And I have heard both uh, uh, stories uh, from uh, coalition and uh, opposition. Right. So. Okay. And uh, again, great. Why not? I mean, I'm always a very curious person, and I'm, I'm happy to listen to everything uh, people say about different things. And I was very curious to hear both sides and and uh, learn more about it this way. But that was, of course, confusing because then I was a little like, okay, that's interesting. Very strong arguments in both sides. Okay, which way to go now, right? And then again, uh, I realized that, and uh, I've, I've kept this thinking with me. Uh, in, in uh, so many things uh, throughout my life, and, and we'll always do that, which is, uh, and encourage everybody uh, to do this, which is that uh, do not charge anything until you have uh, taken the time to learn more about it yourself and experience it yourself, and then make your conclusions. Do not go with what people say. Uh, always good to listen, but if you really want to know, you have to experience it yourself, and then you get all the answers. And that's what I wanted to do, because I was like, okay, interesting, uh, sure, uh, strong arguments. At the same time, uh, and then eventually, of course, I, I started realizing that, uh, yeah, things can be said, but things can be said in any way about everything. So, uh, for example, you know, talking about uh, things like, uh, you know, that would go maybe uh, more uh, to that negative side, which is like, okay, it's this kind of, you know, hidden networking, things like that. My question is to people who say that, which organization is not about networking? Every single one of them is about networking. Every institution is about networking. I went to UNT, I started studying there three years ago. Have I done networking there? Oh, absolutely. I, I met 200 people. These are all my new friends. Well, I can call them yeah, friends in a way, of course. I will know them for the rest of my life, and uh, we are there to support each other, and that's called networking. But we, people uh, very often don't think about it this way. They go after one thing and they label it in a negative way. But you can label all these things negatively, but then that's your choice. And, uh, and no problem with that. But I disagree with that. And I definitely think that uh, uh, it's, uh, it's important uh, to experience things and make sure that uh, things are called uh, the way they should be called. And uh, I did that, and I, never, I have never regretted that decision. And I've found things out for myself. And I've been surprised by what I had heard before, talking about the negative things, how different everything uh, actually has been. And I can honestly say that, that it's, it's, it's interesting uh, that uh, you don't know about things until you really go through these things. And then you realize that, oh, actually, the, the real picture is, is very different. And uh, you should just find out things for yourself to get the big picture. Right. It's always amazed me how non-Masons claim to know more about Freemasonry than actual Masons know about Freemasonry. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And the whole thing, I mean, there are so many things, you know, we talk about, but it's not the topic of this evening. Uh, but for example, I mean, this constant thing, people say that, oh, it's all secret and it's all hidden. Everything is online. 
Go uh, Google uh, large websites, uh, calendars, events, names, everything is there. Phoenix. How can you call secret? Phoenix Masonry. Yeah, and if we have meetings, yeah, for example, exactly. And if we have meetings uh, uh, that are open to our members, again, which organization doesn't have that? I cannot walk into an uh, organization uh, uh, meeting if I don't belong to the organization. But if I want, I can work on it, become a member of the organization or company or whatever, and attend their meetings. But I can't just expect that, okay, I'm welcome to every place uh, without actually being a member of it. But uh, we always can become members of different things, and uh, that's our so, advantage. So we're not secret, we're private. Exactly. And we have our own traditions, but everybody uh, who is interested could reach out to us, learn more about it, the way I did, for example, coming from no Mason uh, uh, background, so-called. Uh, nobody in my family has ever been a Mason. So I knew nothing about it, a uh, completely blank sheet, and uh, I, uh, I just uh, was curious about it, and, and I, I had all the opportunities to learn everything about it, and, and uh, it was all wonderful. So, so today, you are a member of uh, Fort Worth, uh, no, lodge number 148 in Fort Worth, Texas. Correct, yes. And you've been their musician for 10 years. 10 years, long time. Don't yeah. mention it, yeah. Uh, tell oh us a little God. bit about what, what you do for the lodge for music. Well, uh, you know, uh, simple things. Uh, but basically, when we have our uh, stadium meetings, uh, then um, whenever I'm there, I always try to provide a little piece of music uh, for brethren there uh, to just, uh, you know, give something that is a little bit different than what we usually do. Because again, music is something I think that really helps uh, us to get uh, connected and, and gives, I think, a moment. I do that always actually in the very last part of our meetings. And I think this is great because we've gone through different things. You know, people uh, talking uh, all the time and, and uh, stuff. So and when we get to the last point, I think it, it's always just a great moment for everybody to kind of relax for five minutes, you know, just enjoy the music, contemplate, and uh, say goodnight. Yeah, I know Brother Milliken and I have both visited Fort Worth Lodge, and we've we've both uh, really enjoyed your music. Thank you. Are you a member of any side or independent bodies too? I'm a member of Scottish Rite um, in Massachusetts. Uh, okay, very good. Well, getting back to music, you uh, you do a lot of different things with it. Uh, of course, uh, are you play concerts and, and, and you create, you got your own CDs and, and you also teach music, don't you? Yes, I do many things and uh, I love that. Uh, you also director of music at Christ Lutheran Church in Dallas. Say a few words about that. Would you? Unbelievable in a way how it uh, kind of, you know, came on my way uh, because again, you know, I've been always this concert pianist playing concerts and working with other musicians. They were at some point uh, in need of a uh, new, new uh, music director, and I happened to be there, and actually not because I was looking uh, to do something there in terms of leading the music program, but I was actually there to play a concert. And uh, this went uh, together with that time when they were actually looking for somebody new, and they had a chance to meet me, I had a chance to meet them, and that's, that's how this uh, relationship developed and, and got to the place where I was offered to lead the music program, and I've been doing this ever since. So let me get this straight. You're going to school for your DMA. Correct. Uh, uh, you teach piano uh, lessons. Uh, you're a musical director for a church. You practice a lot, uh, maybe two or three hours or more a day. Yeah. How do you find time for all this? Well, uh, not <laughs> always. I don't, actually. <laughs> That's what the problem is. And I'm sometimes so sad that we have only 24 hours in each day, so, well, I, I try, you know, I try to balance things, and of course, sometimes I do overbook myself, and then I'm kind of learning these lessons this way, that, okay, look, you need too much, you have to cut back, uh, because uh, there's so many things uh, you can do, and uh, I want to do so many different things. I, I would never want to do just one thing in music, you know, whether it's then just playing concerts or just teaching, I think I would just get bored. So, and uh, because that's my personality, uh, I've been kind of, I think, attracting uh, these things, which is then, uh, you know, all uh, these different things and doing many things. So I try to, you know, uh, balance uh, my schedule. So if I'm not really playing uh, many concerts, uh, then I'm doing other things. Yeah. And if I'm playing concerts, uh, planning uh, going on a tour, then of course I cut back from other things and I'm just focusing on that. So, but I'm always, you know, 
at yeah. the keyboard, and and uh, that's uh, the most important thing. Well, you know, I left out one thing. You also create uh, uh, CDs. I do. And I you got do. a new one coming out. Yes, you're and right. Yep, very soon. Listomania. 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 Volume Listomania. one. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about Listomania. Well, this is extremely exciting uh, uh, thing for me. This whole project because. I've always had uh, a dream uh, to release a full uh, Franz Liszt album because he's always been one of my favorite uh, composers. And uh, I somehow never got to that. And now I'm kind of uh, fixing that mistake. So, and uh, also, the, yeah, uh, volume one on it kind of uh, shows that there might be even hope for more in the future, but we don't know. Let's not worry about that now. So, but uh, it's again about this, which is that I played uh, Liszt uh, so much in my life and, and his music and I've made so many recordings. So I just thought, that, okay, now I'd like to really focus on it and uh, put it all out. And, and that's what this album is all about. Wow. So can you tell us a little more about Franz Liszt? Sure. Uh, well, uh, there's a lot to say. <laughs> I mean, uh, wow, well, yeah. I, I've heard a rumor that he was amazing. I think, uh, Fred, what do you think? I think we can confirm that this is not a rumor. Okay. Yeah. He was a mason. He was a mason. He was yes. a mason. Yeah. And to my knowledge, uh, was initiated 1844, right. I think. And uh, I think that's yeah, very interesting um, uh, because I've uh, also, you know, felt this kind of... Uh, Mm, connection. Uh, special connection uh, with yeah. him throughout my life and you know I became Mason uh, later in my life so I knew nothing about uh, Masonry uh, and being a Mason uh, uh, before that somehow of course this music was already around me all the time before that time and all these things but I think again there's this kind of thing which is like okay life is like a puzzle right all these little pieces then you know go together and, and form a picture <coughs> but I think that connection I've had with List also maybe it was meant to be and of course came uh, again uh, from home, I think, you know, my parents uh, always have loved uh, listening music. Uh, my older sister, like I said earlier, who was a pianist. I mean, I remember, if I can say I, that I remember when I was an infant, uh, almost, well, uh, at that time she was always practicing at home and she played lots of lists. So I was kind of surrounded by the music. But it's not only that, because you could be surrounded by different things, but still not connect with them. But somehow I think I did, and there was more to that uh, than just uh, having that music always around me. Just uh, I just grew up with it, and I felt, I think, I just felt always that uh, through that music, I could express myself best mm. uh, in terms of who I am and what I want to say through music. Uh, and uh, in his music, I think everything goes to extreme. Romantic composer, so there is everything in his music. and. Uh, now talking about him uh, being a mason i think uh, we could take the topic to another level and say in a way it all makes sense uh, because uh, so is masonry masonry is everything and masonry is everything you want masonry to be and uh, this is all present in his music and uh, and the fact that he was interested in masonry and become became one at some point i think shows again uh, that he was always aiming for uh, uh, you know, higher goals uh, in everything and always aiming for one thing, of course, which has been the bottom line uh, throughout uh, his music always, aiming for light. Mm. Aiming for light, going towards light from darkness. Isn't that what Mason is all about? Right? Of course. So, there's a great connection there and I think it's all uh, present in his music and I just feel I connect with it and there's so many different elements. and. C can, yeah. you, can you speak a little more to how his music uh, aimed for light? Well, uh, he made it very clear himself uh, because uh, he was one of these composers, of course, who loved uh, program music. So, uh, so many uh, compositions uh, by him uh, have titles. So, which is, of course, wonderful because these titles mean something, right? So, um, it, it could be about a book, about a play, so he titled all his pieces because everything he composed was about uh, these things. I'm sure many other composers uh, composed the same way, but who knows, we don't know why they didn't title everything, but uh, I always believe uh, that every composition has a source of imp inspiration which can be just a feeling, emotion, place, uh, book, uh, whatever, right? But in this case, it's, it's so clear, and I think that's wonderful. Uh, for example, I mean, also on that new record, uh, 
I'm playing uh, his uh, Dante Sonata. Mm. And it, the, the piece is called after a reading of Dante, Dante's Divine Comedy, right? So what, what's uh, Dante's uh, Divine Comedy all about? Same thing, right? From darkness to light, if you want to kind of put it into one sentence, right? Sure. And, and describing uh, all these ideas there. So I think, uh, and it comes down to this, which is I think that uh, he just uh, was always searching uh, for answers in this, as well as we are as Masons, right? Mm -hmm. And that's probably why he uh, became interested in Masonry, because he saw, okay, this is another way to search for that light, right? And I think that's really fascinating, and, uh, and it's, uh, it's present uh, everywhere in his music. And uh, then, you know, whether it's about some places or, like I mentioned, you know, Dante or whatever, so you always get the, this idea. And it can be on the simplest level. For example, if it's about the place, it could be something like, okay, you are playing uh, this piece, let's say it's about the lake or something, right? But we experience this darkness, light thing, I think, it's on so many levels in life. For example, you could be outside, right? It's a sunny day, suddenly there's a cloud covering the sun, right? Okay, there is a little bit of darkness there, right? So all these motions and to very, uh, uh, you know, serious detail, uh, all these things are present in his music. It's always uh, struck me as very important in art, whether it's literature or music or visual arts or, or ritual, like we do in masonry, right. uh, that uh, by experiencing a piece of art, we're able to experience uh, something that many other people have through our, through our own filters of perception. Um, of experiencing something very similar, and that's something that uh, can transcend time, and transcend you know s uh, space. Whether whether you're in Estonia, or in the United States, whether you're in uh, you know the 1844 uh, uh, Lodge of Unity at, at Frankfurt on Main, uh, exactly. or or at Fort Worth Lodge, uh, you have that we we as Masons and we as as uh, as humans who have experienced something special I in the arts have, uh, you know, united uh, in this experience and, and had something that we can share together. Absolutely. So, so I think this is the perfect spot that we uh, view a little bit of you playing some lists. Well, let's do that.
okay, we're back. And that, that, that was, once again, that was great. And uh, your new uh, album has a, has a cover that's very interesting. It, it doesn't have the usual picture I would, it, I would think of when I look at it. Okay. Tell us about that cover. Well, Tell yeah, us here about it is. the cover. <laughs> Tell us about the cover. So again, I don't want to limit, of course, anybody to uh, look at it in a certain way. So everybody is free to understand it the way they want. But if somebody would ask me, like you just did, <coughs> what it's all about and why this kind of cover? I mean, where are the notes? Where are the pictures, right? So can't see them, really. Uh, again, uh, what I said earlier about Liszt's music and uh, what was the most important thing uh, for him uh, as a person and, the, and composer, it's the same idea I kind of wanted to express uh, when designing that cover, which is from darkness to light. And I think these elements are present here on the cover. At the same time, you don't have to see it that way. You could just look at it uh, in your own way and, and interpret it uh, the way you find uh, reasonable uh, for yourself. But uh, I think uh, it could be seen uh, that way. And that's something that I had in mind uh, when I wanted to put this together to kind of have that basic uh, element uh, present on that cover, the same element I see being present in his music. What other composers do you like to play? Or what other composers do you like to listen to? Either well, one. I like to listen and play, of course, many, many uh, different things. Uh, uh, so. I'm an explorer, so of course I played uh, many pieces from uh, the Baroque era. I played classical compositions, modern, you name it. Uh, so I'd like to, uh, you know, see what's out there, and it's so endless, the, the material, which makes it, of course, so exciting. Uh, but if it comes down to one thing, uh, what I do most, I would say, of course, I'm this kind of uh, uh, romantic. Uh, as a pianist, uh, meaning that I would then kind of lean more towards uh, the Romantic era, also in history, which is then, of course, Franz Liszt, Frédéric Chopin, Robert Schumann, and so forth. But you've done some arranging, and you've done some more, what I would call, pop music. Yes. And, and, and Christmas music, and other stuff. So you don't, and you put CDs out of you playing it's not all classical music all the time. Not all the time, absolutely. And it's hard to say, you know, how to kind of uh, name it in terms of, you know, how serious I do that other stuff, so-called, you know, my own arrangements. Well, I could say that in a way it's been like a hobby. At the same time, sometimes I want to take it to that level, which is also then doing it as serious and doing classical. But of course, my main thing always is classical music. Uh, but uh, I think sometimes I just uh, feel uh, I'd like to take a little break and then I look into other areas, and uh, very often it's also pop music. And I would say, yeah, pop music that really inspires me. And then if something is very interesting to me, then I'd like to take it even further and, and uh, try to play it myself and arrange it for solo piano, using, of course, mainly my uh, classical skills uh, for that. And that's what I've done. And I think uh, my audience uh, has really uh, enjoyed it uh, too in concerts because uh, that's what I sometimes then try to do to, is to give a little bit of everything, you know, mainly maybe focusing on classical, but also maybe something else, so it wouldn't be always exactly the same thing. Mm. Do you have a particular teacher who's made a big impact on you? Uh, on uh, pop music? Uh, just on, in general. on you in general as a pianist? In general. Well, or as a musician? Uh, I think every teacher I've worked with. Uh, has made a huge difference in my life and I've been so fortunate to have that opportunity to work with so many uh, so-called stars, <laughs> I would say. I mean, already in Estonia I had the best teachers uh, possible, including my father, and uh, then when I came to the States, uh, you know, starting from that time, uh, Boris Berman, Gabriel Chodos, uh, Joaquin Najukaro, Tamas Schunger, Pamela Mia Paul. So all my teachers, and uh, they are all very big names <laughs> in the uh, music industry. So uh, I've been very fortunate to have uh, had so many teachers. And uh, I don't know how many uh, pianists have had that opportunity. I thought about it a lot, so it's been a blessing, yeah. And they've all given me things uh, that uh, have transformed me. And I think i become this kind of package, you know, a little bit of all of them in me plus myself. And then that's what comes out when I play. So. You know what's fascinating to me is, you know, I saw a list uh, somewhere. I don't have it here, so you're going to have to, you're going to have to bring it up. 
when I saw a list of all the uh, cities and states and countries you played in, so tell us, give us the list of where you what, that you can remember. <laughs> Well, you played in Japan, or you know. Well, it's a, it's a long list. I haven't uh, been to Asia yet. I hope okay. one day. But all over Europe. But, and yeah, yes, and the states, of course. And uh, about states, I can make the story very short. Uh, I can just say uh, I've been to more than twenty states, so I don't have to name all the states, I guess. Okay. So many places, and well, in give Europe. Us some countries. Well, in Europe uh, and uh, South America, so well, and uh, beyond that, well, Russia, Germany, uh, Finland, Sweden, Israel. Canada, Costa Rica, and so forth. So it's a long have, list. Have you played in Brazil? I have not yet. Not yet. Hopefully okay. one day. Yeah, I think that's really uh, really interesting. Oh, there are so many great places. Yeah, Argentina also would be exciting. What was your favorite place in the world to play, other than maybe here? <laughs> well, and I think under place you mean probably concert hall or something. Yeah, right? yeah. What favorite concert hall? Well, uh, hard to say. I mean, uh, I I played in play uh, in um, different places, uh, both. Huge places and smaller venues, and I've enjoyed all of them. Uh, and I've always had a chance to say whether I want to play there or not. So I've, I've said yes uh, to almost anything uh, because it's all about you know sharing music with people. And to me, it comes down to one thing, which is that you know if I have people there, and uh, they have come to see me and uh, they purchase tickets to my concerts, uh, then it's just my job to make sure that they go home and feel that uh, you know they got something that uh, they will remember and uh, want to live with. Uh, so, and uh, that's my job to give that, and then if you focus on that, then it's really not anymore so much about uh, where I play uh, in terms of places. But, uh, of course, uh, I mean, it's always great to play in great uh, halls and in big concert halls. I was, uh, again, very fortunate to have the opportunity to play at Myerson Symphony Center a couple of years ago, uh, which is like one of the biggest concert halls in America. So this was great, uh, but uh, again, uh, it's more about the people who come to see me and my connection with them in the concert when I perform. Do you, do you have a, maybe one particular experience where you've had really a, maybe an eye-opening moment uh, performing a piece of music uh, in a particular place, maybe for a particular audience, uh, that really made a, an impact on you? Well, of course, uh, there are, uh, you know, moments where you feel like, oh my goodness, something really magical just happened, right? And it's very, very hard to kind of repeat that every evening mm -hmm. you perform, because every day is different, and you arrive to places in different conditions, you might be exhausted, and all these things. So, but of course, my job is just to make sure that whenever I play a concert and I'm prepared this way, that in whatever situation I can just, uh, you know, express myself the way I want to express myself, whether it then comes out a little bit this way, that way, it's up to the uh, people uh, to decide and the funny thing is that sometimes when I'm not feeling it I'm actually hearing from some people feeling it uh, the way they have never felt anything in their life before which is very interesting also so that means I can't always judge objectively my performances because very often if I feel it was amazing then yes probably it was but at the same time uh, if I'm not feeling it if I'm worried about you know doing the best job possible with the concert, and even if I don't have that 100% great feeling, uh, it's, it's always great to see if, if people still get it and, and, and feel great about the performance. So, But uh, certain performances, well, definitely, I remember all, yeah, well, I think the one we saw recently, uh, the list uh, performance with the Middle Symphony, this was definitely one of these evenings uh, when I felt like, yeah. Wow, it all somehow really came together amazingly. And why? Because uh, I remember, different uh, from some other projects, we had so much time to rehearse together with yeah. the orchestra. It's a fantastic orchestra because uh, most of the people in that orchestra are soloists. Mm. They're not orchestra players. So they play their part like they're playing solo. And that's a wow. huge difference if you play with people like that. And uh, so anyway, uh, and somehow just, yeah, the feeling was great. And I think, uh, yeah, it's always great to look I, at I, I was that there. I was there with you that night. You were there, yes. I was yes. there and uh, it was just electric. Yeah, thank I mean, you. Well, I felt uh, that too. And uh, you know, you just had that feeling. It's like, wow. Yes, yes, it was awesome. So, what about the future, Hondo? What do you want? What does the future hold? Uh, where, where are you? Where are you headed? What are your plans? Do you want to be a, like a, a professor of music at a college? Or? What do you want to do? Well, right? there are many options, and again, uh, we'll see. It's hard to tell. I don't uh, plan well, things in, in advance too long. Before I get there, uh, of course, 
to a certain extent I do that. For example, I'm right now thinking about uh, completing my uh, studies at UNT, finishing my uh, doctorate, and uh, releasing that album. You know, of course, these things are coming up. Uh, what's going to happen after that? I have no idea. So we will see. I let just uh, things roll, and and uh, we'll find out. Of course, one thing I always try to keep in mind, which is that I always uh, plan on. Uh, staying of course connected to music and continuing with music and that's uh, been always my goal and then whatever is going to happen uh, because of that path which is then music then uh, we'll see uh, but there are many many options and of course if I could teach after my study somewhere as a professor that would be wonderful I'd love to do that and I think you know what I've done in the past having been uh, to so many universities and uh, done so many degrees I think uh, I have things I could uh, you know share with students and, and give them uh, to uh, make them become uh, great musicians and become better than they think is possible. Some, some things just seem to drop in your lap. They just, all of a sudden, they happen for you. You know, like uh, Christ Lutheran Church. And, right, exactly. You know, so it just, uh, all of a sudden, it just pops up. You know? Yes, yes, exactly. And again, uh, it's so interesting. Sometimes I think it's, uh, it's better not to worry about things too much and avoid this, which is like, okay, I'm going to plan this now, and then I'm going to plan that, and oh, then it's going to go this and that way. First of all, uh, we never know what tomorrow brings. So uh, that's why I think it's important just to kind of believe in uh, what's important for you, a uh, few very important things, and then uh, follow these things, and then uh, eventually you'll get to wherever you have to get. And in my case, of course, the most important thing uh, right now is music. Well, you've done a lot of concerts all over the place, and we can't mention all of them. But I would like to uh, mention your albums, and you let me know if I leave anything out. Okay, okay. But, and your accomplishments. Hondo Nakur, uh, Waltzy Mephisto by the Danube. 2015, Waltzing Mephisto was awarded with sil silver medals both in instrumentalist and classical music categories by Global Music Awards. Deus Ex Clavier, that was 2010. Uh, Deus Ex Clavier was named Record of the Year. Uh, now I don't know if I can pronounce all this. De Platon des... Yaris. Yaris? In by, yes, yes. by Zeit Online? Zeit Online. Zeit Online, Germany's largest weekly newspaper. Mm -hmm. Works by an HN production. Oh Holy Night, another HN production where you showed your work as an arranger. Correct, yep. And uh, now you have Listomania. Yes. Now, have I left anything out? Album. No, you didn't. Good job. So you got everything covered. And these have been the albums I've released uh, so far. And yep, Listomania is now coming out next. So. Well, wonderful. Well, wonderful. We, did we what miss a saying? picture? We oh, missed yeah. That, that we missed that, huh? <laughs> 148, Fred and Hondo. That was uh, when we, we first got uh, recognition uh, ability to travel from Prince Hall, Grand Lodges, to Grand Lodge of Texas, Grand Lodges. One of the first things I did was to go over to Fort Worth number 148 so I could sit in Lodge with my buddy. Exactly. Hondo. Remember that. Yeah, that was yeah, special. yeah. And that was quite a night. And yeah. I won't go into all the things that happened that night because there were some really great things that happened. But you know, that's a picture of you and me. There we were in lives together. There we were. Yep. Very special evening. But do you have any other questions or remarks? Yeah, I'd like to bring this back to masonry just for a little bit. Um, okay. Brother Hondo, can you you think about? You, you've told us a bit about how uh, Freemasonry has inspired some musicians in in history. Um, but can you tell us a, a bit about how music can inspire Freemasons of today? Well, I think uh, music can inspire uh, anybody always, uh, anywhere. It's just one of those things, uh, talking about good music. Uh, uh, but uh, when we uh, talk about more details, I would say, you know, we have to just, I think, figure out uh, what's the goal of music right and what's the goal of that experience when you're listening to something and and what it's meant to do for the listener right so and I think again it comes down to this what I said earlier which is that if we are always uh, going towards light then I think uh, music in whichever way uh, we experience it uh, can just guide us 
on that uh, path. It doesn't have to be Franz Liszt. It can be Mozart. It can be some pop music, whatever, right? But if it's uh, if it's if it's great music uh, and if it makes you feel good and if you feel good about something and uh, you have all these great emotions, then I think symbolically speaking, that's already going towards light. Mm -hmm. So I think that's uh, what music can do, and it's a very powerful tool. Very good. I I know that in many uh, lodges here in Texas, uh, a, a lodge musician is appointed, but very few. Uh, lodges actually make time for music and so one of the things I've really appreciated about visiting Fort Worth Lodge is that it is a lodge that makes time for music and they're they're extraordinarily fortunate to have you as their musician. Well I'm fortunate to be there and it's always great to share music with brethren that's one of the things I love about Masonry which is this fellowship thing and uh, and just you know being together and then exactly whether it's breaking bread together or uh, sharing music it's all just great. Question. Talking about bringing something to light, bringing us to light, what do you think the cultures of Estonia and American, America could share with one another to bring light from each culture to the other? Oh, that's a great question. Um, more singing? More singing. more singing. No, I can't say that because America is fantastic <laughs> with singing. Oh, come on. Best singers come from America. Let's face it. Let's face it. So, but I would say, um, okay, uh, biggest difference uh, between Estonia and America, of course, is uh, size, right? Uh, Estonia is small, uh, America is huge. So I think, for example, uh, uh, and that, of course, influences people. So in Estonia, I think uh, people are kind of used to that atmosphere, meaning everything is very small. Maybe uh, making them more soft and then kind of, you know, more detailed about certain things and just more focused. And uh, that's a great thing. But if you do too much of that, it becomes also limited, right? So and I think in America, it's exactly the opposite what's going on, right? So everything is kind of huge, large, and uh, Especially in Texas. Uh, people are looking at things uh, differently because it's just so much bigger, uh, talking about really the physical aspect of it. So, and I think uh, uh, if these things could kind of, you know, be done this way, that okay, Estonians would kind of look a little bit more into uh, this kind of very large way of uh, seeing and handling uh, uh, things, uh, which uh, in a way uh, they are doing, but we can always do things better. I think that would be great for them and, and for uh, Americans. I think uh, it doesn't always have to be uh, this kind of uh, very, uh, you know, large and, and uh, big view of uh, everyday life, so-called. It could be also something that, uh, uh, well, a great example of just simple things. So, for example, going to movie theaters, right? So, of course, everybody wants to have huge screens and uh, loud sounds and things like that. And they do that too also in Estonia. But sometimes I think uh, it would be also totally fine to read a book and uh, do something very little and kind of be very focused on it and uh, you know things like that I'm sure many people are doing it but I just think in general I've kind of felt both worlds uh, uh, there's no really right or wrong in any of these things but uh, and this kind of thing I think could be something that uh, both places could do and uh, that would be then good balance you think maybe sometimes in America we're a little too lav lavish we need to get down to the simple things yeah, maybe, yes, yes. And maybe the Estonians are, are good at getting down to uh, sim simple life, simple things, and America is always doing this over-the-top, lavish stuff, and maybe there's a middle ground in there somewhere. Exactly. Yeah. Balance is something we talk about in Freemasonry, too. We do. We do. Yeah, absolutely. It's very important. We have recently, haven't we not? Indeed. Yes. Indeed. More Indeed. questions? Any questions? I'm a huge, huge fan of music. I mean, I, I have a huge array of music. It's very, and it's uh, very powerful. Um, I mean, music can literally take you back to a certain scenario, a certain uh, experience, smell, even um, things of that nature. I was listening to I was listening to a podcast where it talked about lodges taking place in 1695, where we're literally in a shack, and literally probably more than half the time that the the, the, the men were there, the masons that were there, was singing. Like that was part of a lot of the interact interaction. 
in modern day now, we we seeing at perhaps festive boards or, or, or other get-togethers. How can we bring that back to the lodge of uh, an everyday lodge, a weekly lodge things? And, and do you think that's important? And if so, how? I think uh, how is uh, a little easier uh, to answer because how would probably be just really finding uh, musicians and uh, people who could uh, do music. Uh, they would have to be masons if they want to attend meetings and, and make music there. Uh, the other part which is then, uh, is it important? Uh, yes, absolutely it is. Uh, for which reasons? I think that's a little bit uh, you know, longer uh, question. I'll try to keep it short. Uh, but again, yeah, I think uh, similar things I said earlier, it's just this thing which is that, uh, you know, if we uh, experience uh, uh, teachings and uh, this whole idea of uh, becoming better and aiming for uh, light and all these things. So again, it's uh, I think always about uh, trying to be more than uh, what we think is possible. And uh, uh, when we think already this way, I think we are connecting to some other level of reality, which is no longer uh, this uh, physical reality around us, which is you know this table here and uh, these pictures and so forth. And a uh, wonderful uh, thing uh, in that direction, of course, again, is music, I think, because music is uh, this kind of magical thing, uh, which is, you know, you hear the sounds and the, how they speak to you, they speak different to everybody. And that's why I think uh, it's important to have that element present, because it's supporting uh, everything else that, that is uh, there, if we are already thinking so-called, uh, you know, big way and, and trying to uh, aim for something that is not just our regular reality around us, right? And music, I think, just helps uh, us to do that and supports that. And listening to music, uh, playing music, really doesn't matter. I mean, it's all about music itself. And I think uh, uh, it is, uh, in a way, different reality. And we are so blessed, I think, to have access to that every day, right? All of us, uh, whatever music we're talking about. and. Uh, letting uh, good music uh, to guide us more, uh, whether than it is in a lodge or in, a, uh, in other places, I think it just uh, makes us all better and especially for us as Masons, uh, it supports us uh, in terms of what we do and what we want to do, which is becoming better men and uh, focusing on finding light. Brother Michael, yes. So, putting it simply, Masonry and music lift us and take us to a higher place exactly if we spend time with it absolutely absolutely and when we do it together i think this is a great great combination mm -hmm. and that's what yes <laughs> how can we find you online brother hondo www.handonachur.com how do you spell nachur n-a-h-k-u-r thank you so much so. <laughs> and, and we can find your uh, uh, uh videos and, and, and uh, what else? Uh, everything. Uh, everything is on my website. Upcoming concerts, uh, more about the new record, uh, old albums. Uh, I have a long list of uh, recordings available uh, all for free on the site for anyone to listen. So both arrangements, classic recordings. So if you want to tune in and see what I'm doing and what I'm about to do, then please visit my website and you'll find everything there. So visit www hondo brother hondo thank you so much for joining us um as, as we just said music and freemasonry help elevate uh the the spirit of humanity and uh and thank you so much for sharing your light with us thank you well that's all for now this is david bindle and frederick l milliken parting upon the square Pots. <laughs>